Russia now and the dumbest bill in America. This is Mark Fisher with Mark and the Millennials and the Millennial. Joining me today is, of course, Christopher Hopkins, our producer on the other side of the camera. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Mark and the Millennials. This podcast is called Leave Russia Now. Why are we calling it that? Well, the United States State Department warned U.S. citizens to depart Russia immediately Monday, that's today, due to the ongoing war on the Ukraine, risk of wrongful detention, and possibility of terrorism, that is, if you are an American citizen living in Russia. Quote, U.S. citizens residing or traveling in Russia should depart immediately, exercise increased caution due to the risk of wrongful detentions, the State Department's Russia Travel Advisory read. Additional reasons to leave Russia include the unpredictable consequences of the unprovoked full-scale invasion of the Ukraine by Russian military forces, the potential fall of harassment and the potential possibility of harassment and the singling out of U.S. citizens for detention by the Russian government security officials, the arbitrary enforcement of local law, limited flights into and out of Russia, the embassy's limited ability to assist U.S. citizens in Russia, and the possibility of terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the State Department of the United States, who, by the way, is charged with the responsibility of giving you travel advisories and telling you where you shouldn't go and where it's okay to go, and they're giving you the relative risks of going to those places, I'm submitting to you that the State Department of the United States is saying, leave Russia now, leave Russia immediately because of the issues with these balloons that have been flying over the United States. And you're like, well, what does that have to do with Russia? Everything. Everything. Do you think for one minute that the Russians and the Chinese aren't coordinating with one another? Not just with respect to Russia invading the Ukraine, but also with the balloons. Right now, and as of today, there have been four balloons that have flown over the United States or come close to flying over the United States, and we don't know the identity of a couple of them. Well, they come from Russia. Doesn't really matter at this point, because what matters is, ladies and gentlemen, We are at a state of increased awareness to understand that we could potentially be at war. Certainly we're at a cold war, and we've talked about this the last podcast, I know, in in some detail. But more has happened since. Because when was the last time your government told you, hey, you need to leave this country right now, namely Russia? When they say that, it means we're pretty much expecting that there's going to be a full-blown war with Russia really soon. Fine, it'll be fought in the Ukraine, but nonetheless, it's a proxy war between U.S. assistance to the Ukrainian troops and Russia in the Ukraine. And granted, you might say, well, at least it's limited to the Ukraine. Is it really? We just had these balloons flying over the United States. And if Russia and China are powers that are actually cooperating with one another against the United States, and we know that they certainly are in every way, certainly cyber attacks, espionage, um, I'm sure they're trying to do everything they can to potentially starve the U.S. of needed resources, resources that might be necessary to make guns, (laughs) to make bombs, these kinds of things. Well, if they're going to be doing that, and if they are indeed engaged in that, then aren't we at a a stage of heightened awareness where we could be potentially going to war sooner rather than later? If that weren't enough, China has just raised their military reserve age amid increased tension over the Taiwan Strait. Well, the Taiwan Strait, of course, is the body of water between Taiwan and China. And as you guys know out there, in podcast land, the only reason why there is an increased tension is because mainland China 
is increasing the tension. But mainland China is increasing also the reserve. In other words, you no longer have to be like 50 or 55 years old to be in the military. Now you can be 60. <laughs> Does this not sound like a, a large power that is gearing up for what they believe is going to be an extended war? Remember, China is the fastest growing and largest aging country in world history. That is to say, the cohort in China that is aging and getting into old age is the largest ever in human history. So now the Chinese are increasing the reserve age, but they're increasing it not just because of their demographic problem, they're increasing it because maybe they're preparing for war. At least that's what it says in the Epic Times and in some other newspapers as well. Readiness for war. Here's what it says. Wang He, a U.S.-based China affairs observer, told the Epic Times on February 9th that the key point is why China's ruling Communist Party put out the policy to increase the reserve age of people who enlist, why they decided to do that right now. He said that with the current tensions in the Taiwan Strait, the CCP introduced the new military reserve law on the one hand to deter the United States, and on the other hand, it is indeed preparing for war to invade Taiwan. Of course, quote, in general, it creates a momentum to exert pressure on the United States and cooperates with the CCP's general strategy of defeating Taiwan without fighting. However, the question of whether to have a war or not is very delicate. But make no mistake, China is preparing and is prepared for war. Okay. And then also in the Epic Times, military experts issue warnings on possible U.S.-China conflict after spy balloon shot down. Surprise! <laughs> Are you really surprised by that? And then there's the whole issue of DEFCON levels. So my understanding is Def DEFCON levels are those levels that have been created by the United States military. And the purpose of the DEFCON levels is to tell you at what stage of preparedness the United States military is currently at because of potential threats from outside the country. Here's a great example. We have DEFCON 1, DEFCON 2, 3, 4, and 5. So unlike what you might think, DEFCON 5 is actually the normal readiness, meaning that there's a very low state of readiness, okay? There's very little threat, uh, certainly no imminent threat of war. And so therefore, you have kind of just a normal military readiness, um, which means you're prepared, but, you know, you're not actually being told or briefed about a certain thing that might happen. DEFCON 4 means you're above normal readiness. There's some increased intelligence, some watching of certain uh, countries, and there's a strengthened uh, security around bases and sensitive areas, and maybe sensitive um, sensitive parts of, uh, of the United States bases overseas as well. DEFCON 3, DEFCON 3, is increase in force readiness above that required for normal readiness. In other words, here's what it says here. The Air Force has to be ready in DEFCON 3 to mobilize in 15 minutes. That means a pilot has to be able to put on all of his gear, hop in the plane, turn it on, and be ready to go airborne. If not, be in the air within 15 minutes. That's DEFCON 3. It is my understanding, ladies and gentlemen, that the United States of America has been at stage DEFCON 3 for some time. I'm guessing that has everything to do with the war in the Ukraine and the threats that an unstable Putin has made against the United States that he might use small, limited nuclear weapons in Europe, which of course is utterly insane. And when a leader as crazy as Putin, who has nothing to lose, because he certainly is getting older and apparently he is sick, 
has cancer or, or some sort of potentially terminal disease. He certainly sees the end of his life coming. He has nothing to lose because he believes in nothing. He certainly doesn't believe in God. I'm sure he certainly doesn't fear death because why would he act so evil his whole life? So he, that kind of person is the most dangerous person, just like President G, right? I mean, there's a guy who's equally threatening because he's also getting older and he's answerable to no one. He's a totalitarian. He has no worries whatsoever. The only thing he believes in, in terms of religion, is the Communist Party and himself. He is, in his own mind, he is God. So, my understanding, ladies and gentlemen, that we moved from DEFCON 3 in the last 48 hours, maybe 72 hours, which means the Air Force has to mobilize their pilots within 15 minutes. We move from there to DEFCON 2 which means the armed forces must be ready to deploy and engage in less than six hours. It is, quote, the next step to nuclear war. DEFCON 2, again, the armed forces must be ready to deploy and engage the enemy in less than six hours, and it's the next step to nuclear war. So what that means is the armed forces of the United States of America are packing their bags, getting ready, manning the ships, manning God knows what, maybe the drones, I'm not really sure. But they're they're all hands on deck, if you will, for lack of better terms. Um, and we also have the folks who are in charge of the nuclear weapons that are 24-7, you might say, oh, well, they already wear their 24-7 differences. Now they are getting ready to potentially receive some sort of order in real time. That's scary. That's scary. So that's DEFCON 2. Uh, now, we're not supposed to know that we're in DEFCON 2. You might say, well, how, Mark, Mark, how do you know? Look, to be fair, I don't know, but I've had a number of people in the military tell me this. And I think it kind of all makes sense, ladies and gentlemen. Don't you think this is obvious? Don't you think it's obvious? I mean, come on. We have a, one major power sending surveillance balloons one after another across the United States and another major power who's threatening to use small nuclear weapons. They don't get their way in Europe and in Ukraine in particular. And China is the one that up the ante with these balloons. Of course, we're in DEFCON 2. By the way, you know what DEFCON 1 is? DEFCON 1 is another way of saying cocked pistol. It means you're at the maximum readiness and you can respond immediately. It also, another way of putting that is nuclear war is imminent or has already started. That's DEFCON 1. So we're in DEFCON 2, ladies and gentlemen. And what I find fascinating about this is how cavalier so many are in our country because we have a media, and I know I discussed this briefly last week, but we have a media that isn't telling us how serious this is. For example, wh wh why does it have to be a secret that we're in DEFCON 2? I mean, Chris, really? I mean, wouldn't millennials want to know that we're in DEFCON 2? I mean, I'm not sure millennials would take it any serious, any more seriously than, than they take anything else. But DEFCON 2 is kind of a serious thing. I mean, you might want to start, as I said last week, you might want to start making some plans. And I think this is important to talk about because remember how we started this. The State Department said, leave Russia now, Americans. If you're there and you're visiting and you're on vacation, you're sightseeing, you're there with on some sort of contract with some Russian firm, you're there visiting family, which by the way, happens all the time. The State Department is saying, leave, leave now because you might not be able to leave if you don't leave now. And what the State Department hasn't said yet is, leave China now. And I'm waiting for that. I'm, I'm hoping that 
most people who travel to China, you would think they'd be somewhat in the know that maybe it's a good idea to not be in China now. Maybe it's a good idea to pull your businesses out and pull your money out of China. Certainly, I would. I don't have any money in China. I don't have any money in Russia. But let's just say, for example, that you did. I'm pretty sure you'd want to do that pretty soon. By the way, you may very well be invested in a fund in Wall Street that has money in China invested there. You might. And by the way, if you have some of your money invested in a fund, and that fund in turn has invested some of its money, which is partly your money, in China, you might want to find that out sooner rather than later. So if we're at DEF CON 2, and I think the likelihood is very high, don't you think it's about darn time that the United States of America finally, and I mean finally, lets us know? And I wanted to bring this up, ladies and gentlemen, because there is a related story to all of this. And the related story is a story about the United States Navy, which, believe it or not, quietly reshuffled the flyover team of the Super Bowl. You know how you have the, the uh, jets, the Navy jets that fly over the Super Bowl? And you have that every every year, and it's a way of demonstrating U.S. power. It's a way of demonstrating pride in our country and the power that our country has. Well, the United States Navy decided to reshuffle who got to fly those planes to an all-female team. Now, I just want to say this for the record. I have two daughters. I think it's great. There are naval aviators who are women. I think it's great there are naval aviators who are at the highest level who are women. I think that's great. But between you and me, do you know who I want getting the honor of flying over the Super Bowl? The best pilots we have. No matter who they are, no matter what their sex is, and no matter what they look like. But no, the Navy had to do the whole, like, equity thing, you know, Oh, it's not fair that men get to fly over the Super Bowl. Women should fly over the Super Bowl, too. We don't care how good they are as pilots or any individual in that group is versus the other group. What we care about is they have the right gender. Now, seeing that we are potentially in DEF CON 2, ladies and gentlemen, do you really care? Do you really care what the pilot looks like? Who shuts? Who shot? Shoots down? Excuse me, a balloon. Do you care what that pilot looks like? If it's an American pilot, do you care what their gender is? Do you care what the color of their skin is? No. You know what you care about is whether they shoot the daggone thing down, especially if it's armed, like with an EMP attack, or a hypersonic missile, or I don't know, biological weapons. You know what you care about. You care about whether the Navy pilot or the Air Force pilot or the, Marine, the, the pilot who is a Marine, you don't care who they are in the United States military, that you just want the best and the brightest there fighting on your behalf. And so it's fascinating about this. The Navy decided to make this decision about the Super Bowl, knowing that these balloons were coming across the U.S. borders from abroad, mainly from China, I'm guessing, at least so far. We don't know where a couple of these balloons came from. I think, by the way, I think the, the military and the U.S. government does know where they came from. I think they absolutely know where they came from. They're saying they're unidentified. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I think this is all part of a misinformation campaign of your government. Yes, that is correct. I do believe the government engages in misinformation all the time or disinformation. In this case, I think the government knows exactly who sent the other balloons that were, were shot down. But back to, the, back to the point. The U.S. Navy wanted people to fly over the actual Super Bowl based on the way they look and based on their gender. And I have to tell you, it's utter nonsense, especially now if we're in DEF CON 2, because I think Americans care about one thing and one thing only. And that is, if we are attacked, we're not going to attack someone else first. It's not what we do. 
But if we are attacked, we want to win decisively and quickly. And at the end of the day, the last thing we want to do is say, oh, well, we didn't send our best because we sent, you know, a squadron of transgender pilots across the border because, you know, that's the popular thing to do. Well, were they the best pilots, sir? No, but, you know, they were really cool. <laughs> I mean, you can totally see that, right? Especially with the Biden administration. And then there's the other thing, too. Like, if you're in a war and you've got such pilots fighting and one gets caught, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, these, these are prisoners of war. Not a good thing. Not a smart thing. But, hey, I digress. So I also wanted to cover this, too, about the Super Bowl, which we just watched yesterday. I don't know what you all think about Rihanna. Did you see that performance? I know. I I, I watched the performance. Um my first reaction, ladies and gentlemen, podcast land is Rihanna, who performed at halftime of the Super Bowl, is once again, we have an example of the degradation of society because, um, you know, she's she's butt grabbing and then bending over and talking about her butt. And then she's crotch grabbing. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the best we have. Now, from a creativity standpoint, with the floating, with the floating like uh, things in the sky, I'm, I guess there were platforms that were floating with people dancing in them. That was cool. There, there was a lot of creativity that was there, but the actual substance just shows you how much the United States of America has degraded. And uh, I think it's clear that we can do so much better. And I, I had to bring this up because the other part of the Super Bowl that made news is how Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez decided to blast and criticize one of the commercials on the Super Bowl. And that commercial, Chris, was a commercial about Jesus. And the commercial's titled, Jesus Gets Us. Jesus Gets Us. And so, obviously, the commercial is about bringing people back to churches because there has been a cliff that church attendance has fallen off of ever since the pandemic, which I must say may have been part of the plan <laughs> as far as I'm concerned with the pandemic uh, response. Remember how they closed the churches, the governments did? especially the blue state governments, red state governments did it too. But many, many blue state governments, it's the first thing they did. Oh, we can't wait to close the churches. And then what's happened since is that church attendance has not recovered. It has not recovered, not even close. So why does that matter? Well, during the Super Bowl, there was this ad. Jesus, he gets us. And AOC decided to criticize this in a way that is almost unimaginable. unimaginable. She tweets out, something tells me Jesus would not spend millions of dollars on Super Bowl ads to make fascism look benign. So an ad about Jesus, an ad about God, an ad about trying to get people to become faithful again, according to AOC, is an ad about fascism. <laughs> Remember, her God is the climate God, you know? No, we may not have any gas stoves, you know? No, we may not have gas heat. I know that sounds a little Indian, but that's kind of what it is. It's like climate God, climate God, climate God. Yet, AOC thinks that Jesus is fascist. It's incredible. And so she just went on and on and on. It just shows you how sick much of the left is. I think there may be hope for some of them. I'm not sure how many. <laughs> but much of the left is very sick. And I had to bring that up. Because when you see Rihanna at halftime, you just see the degradation of our culture. And then at the same time, there's an ad, Jesus Gets Us. You're like, well, you know what? This is pretty cool. Finally, there's some pushback and reminder of people. 
that there's something greater than us. And I think that that's extremely important because it brings meaning to life and it grounds us as it should. But of course, AOC only believes in AOC. Believe me, she thinks she is God. Kind of like Xi, President Xi. <laughs> hey, like that, Xi and AOC. They both think they're God. They do, they do. And so next up, podcast listeners, ending woke banking. Yes, ending woke banking. Governor DeSantis announces his plan to end woke banking in Florida. So Republican Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced proposed legislation today designed to end ESG woke banking in his state, slamming ESG as elite-driven phenomenon that seeks to impose policies which would otherwise never win favor with the public. Now, as you guys know, ESG is environmental, social, and governance standards. They're a mechanism to inject political ideology into investment decisions. In other words, if you transfer your money to a money manager and your money manager decides to manage your money and put it into ESG type investments, they probably isn't going to meet the best returns in the world. And it most definitely isn't going to meet, I think, many of our podcast listeners' objectives, which is to make money on your money. That's why you have a money manager rather than to make a social statement or a political statement. But ESG is all about that. It's all about silencing people who are right of center. You don't need to look any further, ladies and gentlemen, than the PayPal CEO. Remember that guy? At PayPal, remember, if you pay for things online, many times if you pay for an event online that you're going to, it's like, oh, look, honey, there's an event and it's at uh, a school and it's a school auction and it's at the local high school. We want to go to that. So you, you go online and there's a $25 fee to get in to register for the auction and you pay through PayPal, which is a website that takes your credit card information and your personal information, processes it, and then sends that $25 to the school's account. That's PayPal. All right. Well, the PayPal CEO, some months ago, prior to the election, decided that he wasn't going to allow people to transfer the money that they had raised in their PayPal account to their checking accounts if he disagreed with their political stance on anything. It's incredible. I mean, here's a so-called trusted site that clears payments for you, a clearinghouse of payments that's saying, we are no longer going to honor the money that you raised that belongs to you and give it to you or let you have access to it because we don't like what you raised the money for. And they did just that. There was enormous pushback, including people who decided that they were no longer going to participate in PayPal. And so, as those people left PayPal and canceled their PayPal accounts, only, of course, after they transferred the money that they had raised in PayPal to their checking accounts, they closed their PayPal accounts. There was enormous pushback on PayPal to that effect, and the PayPal stock, stock dropped just in, an, in a huge amount. And that's because PayPal was engaging in its own sort of ESG, environmental, social, and governance meaning that, well, we're going to govern our corporation, even though it's publicly traded, by the way, PayPal is, we're going to govern our corporation, as the CEO says, in a way that is consistent with our values. Well, guess what? You're supposed to govern your corporation that in a way that is consistent with making money for your shareholders. He didn't do that. Guess what? CEO Dan Schulman announced that he would leave the company at the end of this year after his company was criticized for misinformation policy that led to PayPal losing billions of dollars. And it was accused of misinformation <laughs> because he's the one, the CEO, who decided that anything that he defined as violence, racial, or hate, or discriminatory would result in him levying a penalty and or not allowing you to have access to your money whatsoever, which, of course, as you probably have already figured out, had to do with conservative causes. 
So Governor DeSantis of Florida is like, you know what? No more of that. PayPal CEO has already paid his price. He's lost a fortune for his shareholders. He has to rebuild the company to its its previous might because so many people left, rightfully so. And by the way, don't ever go back there. And in addition to that, he's losing his job, which is a good thing. So Governor DeSantis is saying, you know, no more of this ESG stuff. We're not going to allow banking in our state to take place where banks get to decide that you don't, you can't borrow there or deposit money there because they disagree with your political stance on something. That's ridiculous. So he highlighted ways he believes the standards negatively impact the United States and its citizens from increasing the country's dependence on China to violating companies' duties to their shareholders and undermining the democratic process. Quote, this is a distortion of a government by and for the people, DeSantis said. They are not accountable to you. Part of DeSantis' proposal would be to put into statute a resolution he issued last August banning state pensions from considering ESG as investment strategies or investment vehicles. So this is really cool stuff. It's great because you have a governor who has your back if you're in that state. And when you have a governor who has your back in that state, and then you have a company like PayPal, this big corporate, you know, behemoth who thinks that they're not answerable to anyone, including their own shareholders, at least you have your governor and your, your state government behind you. And I think that's critically important, especially at this particular point in American history. So way to go, Governor DeSantis. I mean, this is well overdue. And I'm really glad to see that the PayPal CEO is paying the ultimate price. Namely, he's getting canned, (laughs) which is great. So next up, podcast listeners, taxing the least among us. Taxing the least among us. The IRS is now targeting waiters. This just really pisses me off. I got to tell you. So our militarized IRS plans to target Restaurant tips. Remember, Joe Biden said you got to order, you have to, what do you say? You have to make over $400,000 a year before any of his tax increases, which are going to pay for his many trillions of dollars worth of stimulus, you have to make at least that 400K a year before you're going to get a tax increase. And that tax increase would be used to pay off all the stimulus, you know, money that he's spending or has spent. But now we have an IRS that is militarized because it has 80,000 more agents and or it's in the process of hiring 80,000 new agents. And the IRS has decided that based on over a decade of feedback from restaurants and other businesses seeking the increased flexibility for their overall tax compliance on tips, that the IRS is now going to tax your tips that you make in restaurants. Now. How many of you out there in podcast land waited tables, bust tables, or worked as a bartender or a bar back in a restaurant when you were in high school or college? Well, I'm raising my hand because I did. I was a host. I was a bus boy. I was a waiter. And then I was a bartender. I did all that in high school as well as all through college. And you you want to know why I did it? I did it because it was my way of leaving the restaurant with tips every single night. And that was my spending money when I was in college, as well as high school. I mean, imagine you leave a job and you, you, walk, you walk away with a hundred bucks or more and it's cash every single night. And you're like, man, this is great. And of course, you're at the very bottom rung of society in that, you know, you're you were doing what many people would never consider doing that consider doing namely waiting on people bringing them coffee cleaning up messes um serving food picking up people's dirty dishes and so forth you know what i didn't mind doing it it taught me so much i didn't mind doing it at all and i didn't mind doing it because i walked away with money well now the irs ladies and gentlemen doesn't like that you're the bad person for taking cash home they want to know how much cash you're taking home. It's not fair that you're taking home cash. 
and not paying taxes on that. They want their fair share of your tip income. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. This is Chris. Is a, is a tip not considered a gift? Uh, apparently not. Apparently, well, a gift could in theory be taxed too. If someone gives you a gift, you know, the IRS, anything that they can tax. But here's the thing, Chris, you're, you're actually working. I mean, you're doing this really hard work and Many, many waiters, certainly not all, but many are putting themselves through community college or they're saving for college or they're putting themselves through a four-year college in part and helping their parents um, and themselves uh, to subsidize this education so they can get through through life and, and get educated. And the IRS is like, yeah, we want our money too. We want it. We want it all. We want it all. And it's just ridiculous. And this shows you what an absolute utter liar Joe Biden is. I mean, he's such a liar because he said you weren't going to pay more taxes. There wasn't going to be a crackdown with those 80,000 new IRS agents, except for the richest among us. <laughs> you know, the people that make $400,000 a year, which, by the way, is also they are also not the richest among us. But instead, he's going after the waiters. And by the way, when you're a waiter in a restaurant and the restaurant has a bar, you also tip out the bartender because the bartender makes the drinks for your tables. So you tip out the bartender and then you tip out the busboy. If there is a busboy who clears the tables, you like reward all the people around you that help you be successful as a waiter. I mean, it's a great ecosystem where everybody walks away with a little bit of extra money, which is really a cool thing. At least I think it is. So not only did that happen, but there's also this Wall Street Journal article um, that has to do with Venmo. <laughs> so, and PayPal, excuse me, not PayPal, the other one, the auction platform. What's that auction platform? The one everybody uses uh, when you want to sell something? Okay. eBay, there you go. Venmo, Venmo and eBay. Of course, you got to ask a millennial this. And I have sold stuff on eBay before, but it hasn't been a, it's been a long time since I have. So whether you sell vinyl records on eBay, teach tennis lessons and get paid via Venmo or rent your home on Airbnb, your side hustle can now end up as a tax hassle. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, those 80,000 new IRS agents. The IRS has delayed for a year a new law requiring payment processors like Venmo and Cash App and platforms such as eBay, Etsy, and Airbnb to send tax forms to users who make more than $600 in revenue. <laughs> this is my favorite thing, right? Let's say you have an extra room in your house and you decide to Airbnb it. And you Airbnb it for 100 bucks a night because you live in an area where um, a hotel room is 199. So you have a decent place. People are like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to rent that guy's room. I'm only going to be there for one night. That's great. It's only a hundred dollars. I'm going to save $99. Well, not only does your local government and state government charge sales tax on your room, which you're already paying property tax on because you own the home or you're paying off the home with through your mortgage. But in addition to that, the IRS is saying, well, that's income. So let me get this straight. I got to pay sales tax to the state and sometimes additional sales tax to the local government. And then in addition to that, I now have to pay income tax to the IRS because I might make more than $600 in revenue. <laughs> it's ridiculous. If you think the government isn't reaching into every aspect of your personal life and trying to rip you off, you are crazy. But this is what Democrats do. They overspend at the federal level, and then they have to figure out a way of paying for it. And this is their way of paying for it, is by sticking it to the little guy. But no, if you listen to Joe Biden and the Democrats, oh, they're for the little guy. Yeah, sure. Sure you are. So if you also sell something on Etsy or eBay, for example, you know, you've got, let's say, uh, Let's say you've got some sort of chair or some sort of item that's easy to ship. I don't know. Here you go. A watch. 
right? Increasingly, people don't wear watches. Why don't they? Because of the simple fact that they just look at their cell phone to find out what the time is. So if you'll notice, there are lots of watches for sale now, good ones too, that are on eBay and elsewhere, used ones, used watches. If you sell your used watch, remember, you bought the watch new, you paid sales taxes on it, okay? You paid income taxes on the money that you had to to, uh, make to pay for that watch. Then you paid sales taxes on it when you purchased it new. Now, of course, when you sell it on eBay, if you sell it for more than $600, the IRS wants to know. And they want you to pay taxes again. <laughs> How many times are you going to pay taxes on the same money? And that is what is going on. This exact same thing is going on. And so we have the IRS taxing them least among us. They're targeting waiters and busboys and bartenders. And now they're targeting you, you bad people out there who dare Airbnb a room, or you bad people out there who dare try to sell your stuff on eBay. If you sell it for more than $600, cumulatively, or you cumulatively collect more than $600 on Airbnb, get ready to pay taxes on that too, (laughs) even though... You're already paying property taxes on the property. And the income that you have to make in order to pay the mortgage company so that you can keep the house. Oh, yeah, don't forget about that. (laughs) So this is important, ladies and gentlemen. It's important to bring these things up for the obvious reason that we have a federal government that is so big, so out of control, that it finds that it has to reach into every aspect of your life in order to be able to pay for itself. And this is what Democrats, by the way, and Republicans have caused to happen. Because both parties, both parties have engaged in this overspending, this out of control overspending, which makes government this Leviathan that is involved in every aspect of our lives. Things that we never thought would be possible they're involved in because they need the money in order to survive, government does. They need money to be able to pay off their supporters, naturally. How else would they do it? So we have an interesting story, since we have Valentine's Day. Is that tomorrow? Valentine's Day is tomorrow. And if this podcast airs tomorrow, then it'll be Valentine's Day today, which is Tuesday the 14th. Cracker Barrel is going to dish up free food for a year. For anyone who has a Valentine's Day marriage proposal at the restaurant. So a lot of you don't know this out there in podcast land, but Christopher Hopkins, the producer, actually is getting married in April. So Chris, I strongly recommend that even though you even though you have already proposed to your long-term girlfriend, now fiance, you've been dating her since you were in high school. Now you're, of course, out of college, and but which is cool in and of itself. But I think you should go to Cracker Barrel tomorrow. And leave work early, go there and do the whole ring thing all over again and call the manager over. And then you get free food for a year at Cracker Barrel. I mean, that's pretty cool. First of all, I got a big kudos to Cracker Barrel, you know, because I think that's a a really neat thing to do for people. How they verify it, I have no idea. You know, because I mean, you could have some old dude going in there too. You know, it's just like taking off his ring and his wife takes off the ring. It's like, oh, honey, I've got a ring for you. Hey, manager, come over here. <laughs> you know, right before the bill comes, of course. And then the manager's like, oh my God, it's so wonderful. How long have you two known each other? Oh, like 50 years. <laughs> but we're just now getting married. You know, now we're getting married. Finally, we're getting married. So for all of you out there who are thinking about getting married, or for those of you who are married and want free food for a year, go to Cracker Barrel tomorrow and pretend to get engaged. That's my suggestion to Christopher Hopkins, our producer. Or actually get engaged. Or actually get engaged, yes. (laughs) Yes. So next up, podcast listeners, we have the dumbest bill in America. And do we have a lead up, Mr. Producer? Of course. Here it is. Dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-
And it's the dumbest bill in America, and it is installing trackers on guns. Yes, you heard that correctly. Installing trackers on guns. HB House Bill 704 in the incredibly left-wing communist state of Maryland, put in by Delegate Queen of Montgomery County, the bill is titled Firearms Tracking Technology for the purpose of prohibiting a person from engaging in firearm transfers unless each firearm that is part of a bulk firearm transfer contains a certain tracker requiring a seller or other transferer who engages in a bulk firearm transfer to transmit to the Secretary of State Police certain information providing that a violation of of this act is a civil offense requiring the Secretary to establish a certain database (laughs) and generally relating to tracking technology for firearms. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, you and we, the people in the state of Maryland, anyone who wants to transfer a gun to you, anyone, and they're saying, oh, it's only for book firearm transfers. We know how this works. Because book means, you know, like three or four or something like that. We know is we know that they're going to make this apply to all firearm transfers. And they're going to say, well, when a firearm is transferred legally, it can no longer happen now unless there is this device that is on it. And it's an embedded, embedded tracker is what it says in the bill. I'm going to read this to you. An embedded tracker is defined as an object that is embedded in the frame or receiver of a firearm, emits unique tracking information, and is not readily capable of being removed, disabled, or destroyed without rendering permanently inoperable or destroying the frame or receiver. (laughs) So, ladies and gentlemen, this means that when you go to use your weapon, it could, in theory, also be what? It could be disengaged by some electronic device. You know why I know this? Because I actually have a friend who called me up last year, the beginning of last year, and I feel bad because I never got back to him, and I'm usually very good at back getting, getting back to people. But I, was just, I just was surprised he had asked this, and he left a long, detailed message. And it's the reason I didn't call back. And here is the message that he left. He said, hey, Mark, it's so-and-so. I haven't called you in a long time. I'm working with a company that wants to put a device on the trigger of firearms, and the device can electronically be used by the police (laughs) to disengage the weapon so that it could not be used anymore. Well, isn't that the same thing as gutting? The Second Amendment? How is it any different? How is this any different? How is putting a tracker on your firearm, which we all know what that means, not just tracking your firearm, it's tracking you. And it's not just tracking you, it's also going to be able to disengage your firearm. I mean, literally, this is the full intent of the bill. How is that not gutting the Second Amendment? Well, of course. Because if you live in the state of Maryland or California or Illinois or New York, just as a few examples, these individuals have never read the United States Constitution, or if they have, they don't agree with it at all. They don't support the Constitution of the United States. They don't even know why the Second Amendment is in its place, because they would rather prosecute you, the good guy, than put the bad guys in jail permanently. So Larry King tweets out, Maryland lawmakers want sci-fi technology to track your guns in real time. And here's the thing. This technology, without question, does exist. And your government, I am convinced, at the federal level and or the state level, at some point, state by state, certainly blue state by blue state, they're going to try to find ways of putting devices in your gun to disable them. Namely, when the federal government comes for your stuff because they've run out of money to spend. They've run out of your money to spend that they can take from you 
and they come back for everything. And they're like, oh, it's pretty easy to do now. We can just disable the guns. Sure, why not? I mean, they are, by the way, the federal government is going after waiters, by the way. <laughs> waiters. So I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this dumbest bill in America is not just dumb, but it is dangerous. It is dangerous because Democrats have realized that they can now create not just a surveillance society, but they can use their surveillance society to gut the Second Amendment by disabling your gun through technology. So they've silenced you on social media. They've shadow banned you on social media. And we know from the Twitter files that that's the case. And now you can't even talk about your support of the Second Amendment, because if you do, you're not going to be able to read it anywhere. And now you have HB 704. This is the kind of stuff that is happening in the bluest of blue states across the United States of America, because the Democrats really are no different than the CCP, as far as I'm concerned. On this particular issue, on the, on the issue of Second Amendment and the First Amendment, the Democrats are increasingly more like the CCP than they are the average American. And that's House Bill 704, installing trackers on guns. And that's the dumbest bill in America. And that's it for Mark and the Millennials. Thank you for joining Mark and Millennials. This is Mark Fisher. Thank you to our producer, Christopher Hopkins. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, True Social, Rumble, and our website. See you next time.